Let's take a look today at Ubuntu 20.04. This is the latest release of a lot of people's favorite Linux distro, especially those of you who are new to Linux. And it just came out this month, thus the 20.04. And I'll be showing you how to install it in VirtualBox, and then once I boot into it, I'll show you guys some of the newest features with this release. So to download it, of course, just go to Ubuntu's website and click this green download box right here. It's gonna redirect you to this page where it thanks you for downloading, and then you can also donate some money to the Ubuntu team if you want. Now, once our ISO has downloaded. You want to come on over to VirtualBox. We're going to create a new virtual machine. Um, and as always, what I'm going to be showing you guys here is pretty much the same way that you would install it on hardware. The only real difference is that instead of creating a virtual machine, like you're going to see me do here, you would just want to burn the ISO to a um, flash drive and then boot from that. So we'll call it Ubuntu. And VirtualBox should be smart enough to pick the correct type and version for us. If yours doesn't, then just select the type is Linux and the version Ubuntu 64-bit. We'll go to the next screen and we want to crank up our memory to about four gigs. This is the same amount that it recommends us to do on the Ubuntu webpage. So we're gonna follow that. You don't need a terrible amount of memory for Linux though. It's not Windows obviously, but it's good to do a bit more with something like Ubuntu because it's not as lightweight as Arch or Gentoo is. For our hard disk, we'll do VDI. And I'm gonna make it a fixed size because fixed size is a little bit faster, but keep in mind that with a fixed size virtual disk, you can't adjust the space later. So if you're gonna create a VM to actually do stuff with it, Make sure you do some planning beforehand to make sure you get the right size. So we'll do next. I'm gonna make mine about 30 gigs and then we'll create it. And then we just wanna make a few other changes in our system settings. So I'm gonna set the processor to be two processors. Uh, this is the same thing that they recommend for us on Ubuntu's website, a dual core processor. I'm gonna change the boot priority to be hard disk first. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because it will allow me to just install Ubuntu and then go ahead and reboot it and go right into the hard disk instead of looping back into the ISO over and over again. You just have to make sure that the hard disk is above the optical drive for the boot priority. And for the display, I'm gonna crank my video memory up to 128 megs. I'm gonna change the graphics controller to VBox VGA because I'm running VirtualBox 6. That way I'll be able to have a full screen. And last but not least, add your virtual, um, not your virtual, but add your ISO. And let's do, uh, if I can find it, uh, here we go, Ubuntu 20.04, okay. And then we'll go ahead and start it. Mine's gonna start off screen because that's just what it does. It can't work perfectly. That'd be too easy if things worked perfectly. So it's booting from it now. Well, it's doing a check disk first. Make sure that uh, everything with our installation medium is good. And there were no errors found. It's just a fresh ISO that I downloaded from the internet. I actually can't remember whether or not that's new. It's been a while since I've installed Ubuntu, and I don't know if it always does the check disk. But we do have this new, uh, this new mascot, I guess you can say. It looks like, I think it's a bobcat. That's cool. I like that a lot better than the rat. The rat is like... I don't know. I, I don't really understand people that really identify with the rat as like a cool animal. You know, it's such a such a small, weak, feeble thing, right? Like rats are food. You feed rats to bigger animals. Anyway, <laughs> let's go ahead and install Ubuntu. Enough rambling about rodents. And I'm going to choose my language is US. My keyboard is US. And I'm gonna do a normal installation. So that's gonna give you a web browser, your utilities, office software, some games, media players, 
And sure, let's download updates while we install Ubuntu. And let's also install third-party software for our graphics and Wi-Fi hardware. And we want to erase the disk and install Ubuntu. And yep, that's my time zone. So we'll create our name. And let's do a login automatically. It's a VM, why not? I wouldn't really recommend doing that on hardware, especially if you're gonna be having a computer uh, in a house of multiple people, or if you're gonna have a laptop, it could get stolen and people just log right into it. All right, so now that's doing its thing. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video. Usually this takes a few minutes and it's kind of boring to just watch something install in the background. All right, and the installation is complete. It actually didn't take too long on my system. It took maybe four or five minutes. I gotta say, it seems like the install times are getting faster and faster on uh, Ubuntu, Linux, Mint, all of these kind of like newbie distros. They just keep getting better and better. I might actually have to switch back to one of these, you know? It might, it might not even be worth continuing on with Gen 2 and Arch Linux to use these. I'm just kidding though. They're, they're probably never gonna give you the same type of flexibility that you have with Gen 2. I mean, they really can't since you get to compile everything yourself. So here we go. This is the latest Ubuntu. You can connect these accounts if you have them already in Ubuntu single sign-on, Google, Nextcloud, Microsoft. I'm not gonna be connecting any of these accounts. That's, that's always seemed kind of spooky to me to have an online account that's connected to your computer when you're doing offline stuff. So you can opt into that if you want, but I won't be doing it. There's also this, um, live patch feature. So canonical live patch, it updates your computer without actually restarting, which is one of the cool features of Linux. I, it's not really something that uh, I think is so special to live patch, but in case you didn't know, most updates that you do in Linux do not require you to actually reboot your system. And this is great if you're a user, obviously, you don't have to have I don't know, a few seconds of downtime, or I guess more realistically, it might be a minute or two of downtime for it to apply updates and then reboot your system. But if you're running a server, this is huge. I mean, this is one of the main reasons why Linux dominates the server space and Windows does not, is the fact that you can do almost any type of update to the system without taking it down, without having to uh, have that service or whatever you're doing on the server be offline to your users. Because if you run a server and you're making money off of it and it goes offline, there goes your money, right? T downtime is literally money wasted in a server environment. And then of course we can help improve Ubuntu. I'm not gonna send system info. That's also seems a little bit spooky to me. And then for privacy, it leaves the location services off by default. So. Props to Ubuntu for doing that, for not automatically opting you into location uh, services and keeping tabs on where you are geographically. All right, and then we are all ready to go. You can go ahead and install these softwares if you want. If you're actually gonna be installing it to hardware, you'd probably want to use some of these, but I'm just gonna be showing you the features of the core OS, so I'm not gonna be doing any of that. Um, the software has been updated now. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and install that new software in the background. Now in terms of new features, you've probably seen a lot of these if you've watched my video on Ubuntu 19.10, but a lot of these features have been polished a bit in the newest release. You can disable all notifications by clicking on the clock up here to display the notifications window, and then you can tick the do not disturb switch here to disable all notifications. The settings panel has also been polished a bit. This all comes with the latest version of GNOME 3.36. 
Inside of the applications panel, we can now group our apps together by just clicking and then dragging it onto another one and put them into pretty much a folder, just like you would on an Android phone. And then of course we can rename this folder. We'll call it, uh, I don't know, random apps because your calendar and your camera, I guess, don't really go together. You can also switch workspaces by doing control alt and the arrow key down. And this is common in a lot of distros and desktop environments. Even Windows has finally caught up with this in Windows 10, but different desktop environments have slightly different ways of implementing this. Now, some things that I kind of like about this GNOME implementation of workspaces is that by default, it tries to prevent a sprawl of workspaces. So by default, it will not allow you to arrow down with control shift down unless you actually have at least one app open on the current workspace. So if I close this application here, I'm no longer able to go down. And this same thing will happen on new workspaces too. So like if I open Rhythmbox, go down here, and then open files, I have to do that before I can actually go ahead and create this other workspace here. If I close this, now you see I'm not able to go down to the next workspace. So that's pretty cool. Uh, one thing that I don't like about this though is that it doesn't wrap around. So like if I want to go down to, um, I don't know, workspace three in this case, I can't just arrow down again to wrap around back to workspace one. I have to go to workspace two and then to workspace one. Now you could change this in the settings. Like I said, this is all the default stuff, but that's just one thing that I don't like about the defaults. Um, and we also have a new lock screen. So it has a similar aesthetic to the Mac OS. As you can see, it blurs the background um, of whatever you're working on, and it's really elegant, and most of you will probably appreciate this as well. And they've also added a toggle option to be able to show your password here. So that's great in case you're having trouble of logging in. You can actually see what was typed. Now, one problem that I do have with this though is that you only have to click on this once for the password to be revealed instead of clicking on it and holding it uh, like you would in Windows 10. And I think that the security of this is flawed because it's easy to imagine a scenario where people are working together in an office and maybe you have to get up to go get some coffee. And so you lock your screen. Well, one of your colleagues could just come over here and click this little I to make the passwords plain text while you're away. And when you come back, you may not notice this change because you see it's subtle. It's just an I or an arrow or not an arrow, but I guess like a line going through the I. So your colleague could just click that and you might not notice. And then you come back to type in your password and then your colleague is able to capture that password. Um, in plain text, right? They can just shoulder surf and read it or they could capture it with a cell phone. So I really think Ubuntu should either change this to be a click and hold because like I said, the only time that I've ever even used this feature in password boxes is if I've typed my password like two or three times and it keeps telling me I'm wrong and I'm like, okay, let's see what I'm actually typing to see if I'm being stupid and making a mistake. Um, it doesn't make sense for it to permanently stay. Well, it's not permanent. Like if you, for example, switch to this and back, it disables it, but it just doesn't seem like a good idea for it to show that and you be able to see it. It should have either some kind of obvious notification that's like, hey, your password is gonna be shown in plain text or just make it a click and hold like Windows 10 does. So again, I, I, I don't like, ever having to give Windows props to where it's better than Linux, but there are some areas where it just does end up being better than certain distros, and that's one of them. Uh, so now let's log back in and take a look at some other cool features. Um, Ubuntu has added a dark theme. Uh, let me find it in settings, and then it's over here in appearance. So they just have an easy 
one click dark theme. And it's one of the best dark themes that I've seen so far on a Linux system that doesn't require a significant amount of tweaking and time to get it looking good. I mean, this alone is almost enough for me to want to use Ubuntu right here. Um, Ubuntu 20 is also using a newer kernel. It's using 5.4 by default, which is a much faster kernel, and it always ha it also has more hardware support than the previous one. And the boot time especially has been increased due to switching to the LZ4 compression algorithm. Uh, this kernel also has native XFAT support, so there's no additional software that's required to be able to read and write to XFAT drives. Um, the Ubuntu store has also had a change. So it's now natively integrated with Snap. So you can look for applications that normally you would require Snap for, like I think um, PyCharm is one of them. Yeah, so you can see over here how it changed to this channel. And you can also choose which channel of Snap you wanna use. So by default, it's gonna be using the latest stable, but you could switch to like a beta or you could switch to an edge channel as well. So that's pretty cool. And it also increases the amount of software that's, well, it doesn't really increase the amount of software support, but I guess for a normie, it increases the amount of software they have access to because now they don't have to try to mess with Snap on the command line. They can just do everything inside of the nice little GUI. So I think at this point, I've covered most of the new features that are in Ubuntu. Um, let's do an HTOP real quick, just so that we can sort of footprint where Ubuntu's at in terms of resource usage. So I actually do have a couple of things open now. I've got Rhythmbox, Settings, a Terminal, uh, Thunderbird is open somewhere, and I've got two, three actually workspaces that are opened. And you can see that we've managed to stay under two gigs of memory. So again, anyone who's working at Microsoft, if you're a dev, take some notes because Linux is killing you guys in terms of resource usage. There's no reason why your system needs to idle at two flipping gigs of RAM usage. It's It doesn't make sense, right? I've got several apps open. We're still under two gigs. And this is important because there's still computers being made today that have two gigs of resource usage. Because for some folks, that's all they need, right? Some folks, they really don't need to spend hundreds of dollars on a laptop or you know, hundreds or even thousands of dollars on a desktop. Some people, they just wanna go on the internet and, and look at some stuff. And we can even open Firefox and we'll probably still stay under two gigs. Like, look at that. We got Firefox open. We got, let's do multiple tabs, right? We'll have multiple tabs open. We'll have a Google. Let's also do a YouTube. YouTube is pretty heavy. Lots of JavaScript running there. And we still manage to stay under two gigs, which is what Windows 10 just idles at by default, okay? Like if you've got a Windows 10 machine or a Windows 10 VM, go ahead and load it up. See how much your RAM usage is. It's probably not gonna dip below two gigs. All right, so anyway, that's it for this review of uh, Ubuntu. Had to go off on a rant and bash Microsoft a bit. Uh, try it out on your systems, especially if you're able to run virtual machines. You can download it and try it in a VM like I've got here. And if Ubuntu seems right for you, especially if you're using a non-free OS like Windows, give it a try. Give it a try on hardware. You could dual boot it, see if you're able to live within Linux, and then finally, break the shackles of Microsoft and proprietary software, because most of the time it sucks anyway. Like it's not even, it's, it's bad enough that it's closed source and it's spooky and you can't even see what's going on on your system. The open source software is just so much better. So that's it for this one, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.